Good morning. This Good morning. is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is February 26, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Steve Fatorek. Is that correct? That's correct. Fatorek. And would you spell that for us, please, Steve? It's uh, F T. O R E K. Can you tell us uh, what derivation that is? Yeah, my parents came from uh, Czechoslovakia. And uh, my mother was just an infant when she came over. My dad was 16. So my mother was educated, so she was able to help out all the people that came from there that were older than she was. Okay. So I got it. Yeah. I just couldn't place the name, and yeah. thank you for telling us. May I ask you how old you are? I am 81 years old. 81. And your current address? In Needham. Massachusetts. Okay, and your current marital status? I'm married. Do you have children, Steve? I have three children and seven grandchildren. And where were you born? I was born in Canton, Ohio. Canton, Ohio. You're going to have to forgive those sirens out there. We're very near a fire department right. here, as you can. That's all right, it'll happen again. You were born in Ohio. Were you raised there? To I was uh, born and raised in Ohio. I left there when I came into the service. Okay. Tell us about uh, being in Ohio 81 years ago. What was it like where you grew up? Well, it was a town that had uh, steel mills and uh, the Tim Carolla Bearing and Republic Steel. And uh, sort of a white collar town. And most of the people ended up working in either Republic Steel or Tim Carolla Bearing Company. And it was a hotbed for football, <laughs> for high school sports. Did your dad work in the mills? My dad worked at Tim Corona Bearing for, for yeah. about 25, 30 years. And how about you? Did you eventually I work worked at Republic the... Steel for three years before I went into service. Yeah. yeah. And how about your mother? What did she do? My mother was just a housewife. Not just and a housewife. She, she was a housewife, yeah, which yeah. was a, a big job. Hard work. Yeah. That's right. Did you have brothers or sisters? I had one brother and one sister, and they're both still there. Yeah. So you went to grammar school, high school, and, yeah, went to, and football was a big deal? It was a big deal, but not for me, because <clears throat> I was too small to play. I graduated when I weighed 125 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a gun. Yeah. At the time you were going into high school, um, what was going on in the rest of the world? Because you said you went into the service, or you, uh, I know you went into the service when you were 22 years old. Yeah. What was happening in the world when you well, were in we high school? Just coming out of the Depression. Yeah. Because the, I know all the mills had been shut down for about three years, and then they just started going back again in the early 30s. and. Uh, when I was going to high school, things were just starting to creep up. And also, in Europe, I believe that's about when Hitler started showing his face a little bit in Germany there. The early 30s, that's yeah. correct, yeah. Yeah. Did you hear about that or have any sense that anything happened in, in Munich, Germany was going to affect your life? I never had any idea until uh, I remember they used to show a lot of his speeches on radio. I mean, they didn't show them. I mean, they used to broadcast them. I and mean, when you when you hear these crowds, you knew there was something fanatical going on. But I never realized it would affect me in any way. I Where, figured it would affect people over there. Yeah. Where were you on uh, December seventh, nineteen forty-one? I was home on that day, and I didn't hear about it till the next day. And somebody told you something happened at a place called Pearl Harbor? Got on the radio, yeah. Now, how old were you then? Uh, let's see. I was about 18 years old. No, no, I wasn't 18. I was 42. I was 21. 21 years old mm -hmm. at, at Pearl Harbor. Yep. Had you signed up for a draft or anything yes. like that? Mm -hmm. So you had a number. Yes. And yep. uh, did you know when you would be called? No, we didn't know at the time. No. You got a draft number. Pearl Harbor is bombed uh, the next day or that following week. 
the United States went to war. Uh, did guys from your high school or your acquaintances go on into the service? Yes. In fact, one fellow lived in our neighborhood I grew up with. He was in the National Guard. And they took the National Guard from, from our area, right from our town. They went right down to Guadalcanal. And uh, the poor guy spent time down there, and, and he got an early discharge. I guess it uh, kind of bothered him, and it was sad to see that. He was a nice guy, but when he came back, he was different. Yeah. He, was he in the Army or the Marine Corps? He was Corps? in the uh, Army, yeah. Did you, how, did, how did you get into the service then? Uh, you were called up in the draft? <clears throat> well, we all had to, we all had to uh, report to a draft board, and then they gave us some idea of when we might be called. And they gave us the numbers, and uh, my buddy and I, we got to thinking, why wait to go in there when we can pick a service we want? <laughs> and I wanted to get into a service that was, wasn't, it was sort of small. You know, the branch of the service I wanted to get was a small one, and I figured the Coast Guard would be the best thing to get into. And uh, so uh, we both went up to Cleveland and signed up to go into Coast Guard. You're in Dayton, Ohio, and I don't in Canton, imagine, Canton, Ohio. excuse me, Canton. Uh, did you have any experience at the at the ocean uh, or sailing? What I'm asking is, why did you pick the Coast Guard? Because I I, uh, I knew they'd be on small ships, and I didn't figure I'd want to be on a big one because that's like being in a big building or something. So I figured you'd get on a small boat. You know, it's it's uh, be uh, it's more leisurely on there, and it won't be as strict. That's what I figured. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So anyway, that's why I went there. So I, you, and, you and a friend went up to Cleveland yep, and so enlisted in the Coast Guard. Yes. Tell us about that. That's, uh, that's quite a move to make. Well, our parents didn't know whether we should go up there or not. And uh, so I told them, I'm going to go anyway. So I might as well go where I'll feel more comfortable. So I had an uncle that took us up to Cleveland. And we just went up there. And, Signed up, that's all it was to it. They gave us a date to report back. And uh, so we went home and we got the call. We go, went back up to Cleveland and got shipped down to a training camp down at uh, Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. Okay, when you went up and talked to people in the United States Coast Guard as a live candidate, did they talk to you about what kind of service you might have, what you would do in the Coast Guard? No, they didn't. No. They said, you come in, and we'll take care of you. Okay. <laughs> That's it. And, and on what date did you enter the service? Uh, April 22nd, 1942. 1942. Mm -hmm. Tell us about being called up. Were, were you and your friend called together? Yes, we were. Okay. And then Both you went us. to Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn, New York. Yep. Tell us about going from Ohio. Had you, had you been east before? Uh, well, the only place I had been east before was that went, a friend of mine and I, we took a ride down to Florida on the motorcycles back in 37. That was, as far as, that was the only time I was ever east, and that's the only time I ever saw the ocean. Had you ever seen New York City before? Never. No. <laughs> that was quite a thing we yeah. pulled in there. We came in on a bus. We got off the train station. They put us on a bus, and we're driving down to the base. And I... It's a hot day and the windows roll down. I hear this bus driver hollering at a policeman on a, on a corner and I could hardly understand what they were saying. I mean, they had that Brooklyn accent. Yeah, they were talking Brooklyn they were kids. Yeah. <laughs> that was a That was something. How many of you guys were on a bus? For over 40, about 40 of us on the bus. All from Ohio? Oh, yes, all from Ohio. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, now that's your first place you were sent and that's for basic training. That's right. Tell us what happened to you there. Well, <laughs> we were there pretty early, and the place we went to it used to be a summer resort, and it had a lot of little cottages there. And uh, it was squared off in blocks, and each cottage was numbered. And uh, they put us in the cottages, and then, you w then the next morning they have you muster out in front of the cottage, and they they're telling you that you're going to learn to march and you're going to have to obey. And we used to get out of the 
we used to go down to the beach and march. And they said they're going to give us uniforms and everything else. But when we got there, they didn't have any clothing yet. So we were in our civilian clothes for about a week. <laughs> if shoes got ruined. Oh, t- and, uh, and the, uh, but they had a mess hall there, and they had good food there, I will say that. That was good food, but they didn't have anything for us to really train with. We had the marching in the sand, and we had the uh, rowboats. We used to go out and row a lot. That was fun, rowing out in the road. Yeah, we had rowboats. That's what and we you did. rode around on Sheepshead Bay? Yep, <laughs> that was it. Yep. So they had no guns or anything. How long did this go on? I mean, I think it was six they, weeks. They must have shaped up after oh. a while. Yeah, we finally, after about a week, we got our clothing. And that was nice to put clean clothes on. <laughs> and uh, then they made a new mess hall there, too. So it was a pretty good place. By the time we left, it was pretty well organized. In, in six or eight weeks, what did they teach you about going to sea other than putting you in a rowboat? Nothing. Nothing. So you were obviously going somewhere after this to get more further training. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you ever get into New York City? Oh, yes. Yeah, we used to go there on, on the weekends. You did? And then uh, I got back to New York, too. I went to a Hemphill Diesel School there for 12 weeks. But when you left uh, Sheepshead Bay after eight weeks or eight, six or eight weeks, what happened to you then? I went to Boston. You went up to, came up to Boston. Yeah. They, while we were in boot camp, they uh, said they're going to have to train a bunch of fellas for uh, shore patrol duty because uh, along the whole East Coast they had Coast Guard guarding all the uh, docks and piers all the way along this, the country there, all along the shoreline. And uh, so they picked a bunch of fellas that they were going to uh, send up to Boston to work along the protecting the docks. And they picked the bigger fellas. And I remember a couple of little guys wanted to go on. And the guy says, well, look, what if some six foot two, 200 pounder comes after you? What could you do? So you, the, you were at 125 pounds, uh, so what happened I to wasn't you? one of those guys no. that was picked. So they took these fellas that were picked, and they sent them down to the Marine training camp. And they gave them another boot camp down there. I didn't know that at the time. So they picked these elite, this elite group and sent them down to the Marine base for another boot camp. Is it Paris Island that they went to? Paris Island. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> the rest of us, most of us, my group, went to Boston. And uh, we went to the Brunswick Hotel. And they put us on shore patrol duty. So I figured, well, whatever that is. So the next morning, we put, they put us in trucks took us down to the different docks and piers in Boston, and there we were doing the stuff, the same thing that those fellows went down to Paris Island to train for. <laughs> so after a few weeks, a group of fellows come up into the hotel, and here they, those are the same fellows that went down to Paris Island. And when they found out that we were up here doing what they went down there to train for, they went nuts because they had to go down and get another boot camp down a marine camp. Tell us typically what you did uh, in this particular well, job. We used to go down for eight hour watches. They, on they, the piers of down Boston? Down the piers, yeah. yeah. The truck would drop off a couple of men here and a couple of men here. And uh, eight hours later, we had, we had to just stand watch, make sure nobody comes around and nothing strange happened. Were you armed? Oh yeah, we with, were armed. With what? Yeah, we had a, we had a revolver and we had a rifle. And uh, it was an eight-hour watch. And I was down by Constitution Wharf when I first went down there. And at night, did you go back to the Brunswick Hotel? That's where well, you, you were billeted? It depends on what time I went down. If we went yeah. down at eight o'clock in the morning, we were there till four. And then we get down there at four, we're there till midnight. If you get there at midnight, you come home at, back up at eight. Yeah. So, but you were stationed out of the uh, Brunswick, Brunswick Hotel? Brunswick Hotel, yep. And how long did you do this? Well, I did that for about a half a year, and uh, this takes you up to about October. You, you were doing this, yeah, or longer? No, longer than that. Longer than that because yeah. it snowed. Because I, that's right. One of the chiefs that used to go around checking on everybody, he ended up with a jeep, and he wanted me to drive him. So I ended up driving this 
chief all the way along the, along the uh, shoreline. We'd go from post to post, you know, check on everything. This yep. is uh, 42 leading up to the end of the year. Yep. Um, did you ever have an incident? Did you ever have to protect government property? Not use your weapons. Happened. No. In fact, we were, they were, you know, we were supposed to be there. Then a lot of these ships were supposed to be coming back. I had taken things over to, over to uh, Europe mm -hmm. and England, and uh, they tell us when the ships come back, let us know as soon as they're here, and make sure nobody comes in or nobody leaves. None of the ships came back. All those ships from the United Fruit and all those places, they all got sunk. At least while I was there. I didn't see one come back. Everything was gone. Yeah. They had been attacked by submarines, I take it. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, yeah. Sent down. Were, was your friend with you all this time? Uh, no, when we left the camp, he was in sick bay. So we got split up. What yeah. did you like about this kind of work? Or dislike about it? Well, I didn't care too much for it, but it was interesting to you know meet different people and 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 uh, I had never been around the uh, short you know the docks and piers before, so I was you know, that was something new to me. But then it wore off, but it was something I had they they wanted me to do, so I just did it. Mm -hmm. Did you receive advanced or specialized training um, beyond what they had given you for guard duty? Well. I, from there, I got sent to New York City. I went to the Hemfield Diesel School for 12 weeks. What was the name of that? Hemfield Diesel School. Hemfield? Hemfield, H-E-M-P-H-I-L-L. -E okay, where was that? And uh, I believe that was in Brooklyn, but we stayed at the Midson House Hotel in New York, right on West 70th Street, and that was just a couple of blocks away from uh, Central Park. So we were right in New York. <laughs> And uh, we used to march every Saturday morning. We'd come out in front of the hotel, get out in the street, line up in platoons, and march over to the Central Park. And that was our, we marched every Saturday morning. In that was your Central parade Park. ground. That was our parade ground. Yep, that was it. At this point, you're learning diesel operations. Yes, or, uh, diesel motor mac, motor okay. machines. What specifically did you learn? Well, I learned how they run. I learned how to take care of them. And fortunately, they showed us how to take care of the, the, the injection diesel, the, the injection nozzles, nozzles, because that's the part that you really have to take care of on a diesel, mm -hmm. the nozzles that inject the fuel into the cylinders, because these diesels, you start them up, they run forever anyway. So they're pretty good engines. But we learned a lot about the pumps, fuel pumps, and the injected nozzles. Something in, in your background must have suggested to the Coast Guard that you could do this. Where, did you have uh, tests or mechanical ability that uh, put you into diesel school? <coughs> no, I was just informed one day that I was going to go to the diesel school. That's how I was and surprised, but I was pleased. Did other people you knew uh, go with you to this school? Nobody. That I, well, yeah, there were. Other other fellows that were in my group there, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they went with me. And how long did that last? Twelve weeks. Twelve weeks. So this takes mm -hmm. you up into forty-three now. Yep. And you're in New York, and yeah. you're getting out of diesel school. Um, is this something you wanted to do, or would you have druthers? You'd rather have done something else. Oh no, I I, I like that because you, I do you enjoy I this work. Ship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I like that. Yeah. So. You're about to maybe ship out. Uh, did the Coast Guard prepare you for going overseas or cultural differences that you might encounter in other countries? Not really, no. No lectures about how to behave, nothing like that? No. What we did, well then from New York, came back to Boston, and they were supposed to uh, send us out on, I think, mm, some, I don't forget what the name of this boat was. We were supposed to go on a certain kind of a boat, LSTs, I think. And uh, they then changed it and they put the Navy fellows on it. So there we were at this receiving station in Boston, ready to go someplace. And uh, 
but they didn't know what to do with us, so they sent a bunch of us down Cape Cod to the surf stations. That was a great deal. You get on there in June, and there was nobody down there, just the servicemen. And it was a great place to spend the summer. Did you say surf stations? Yeah, surf station. Yeah. What's a surf station? What's that? What is a surf, surf station? Surf station, that's where the people are that uh, stay while they patrol the beaches. Mm -hmm. And if anything comes ashore or anything happens there, you report it. So the, they, have the, they patrol the beaches all the way, all the time, 24 hours a day. Somebody's out there. They even had dogs. And I was there as a motormac, but uh, I also went out with, walking the beaches with the dog too. Where were you, and, and I'm, I, I'm totally unfamiliar with the date, but where were you when those guys got off a German submarine and came ashore on Long Island and got caught going into the city? Oh, uh, were, were you any part of no, that? No, no, I wasn't, no. Did you know anything about that at the time? I heard about it, but that's about it. Yeah. But this is really what you were doing, weren't you, patrolling beaches? Uh, not in New York. No, uh, on, on Cape no, Cod. Cape Cod, yeah. In case somebody came ashore. Yeah. Um, what kind of training did you have for that? Well, that was the training they gave us down at, down at the uh, uh, boot camp. They told us what to look out for, the way ships might look at night, and uh, to check on you know people that might look suspicious, and they even told us if you see something laying on the ground, you know it's that you don't think should be there, pick it up because it could be some kind of an incendiary thing that somebody might have dropped or something. So they told us about things like that. What did you look for for ships offshore that were suspicious? Well, if we saw anything, we had to report it. Mm -hmm. No matter what, we had to report it. And, and in all the time you were doing this, did anything happen or did you pick up anything? or see, The only thing that anything? happened was I was walking along one night and it was black as could be. There was no lights any place. And all of a sudden, just about 50 yards offshore, I see a million lights come up. Red lights, white lights, and everything. A ship somehow, it was a, some Norwegian freighter, somehow he got through the shoals that were out that way, the sandbars all over the place, and he came almost all the way into shore. And before it got grounded, and uh, there was a little excitement at our surf station in that night. <laughs> the chief that was there, he's ready for retirement the next year, and he didn't want any waves. So he, he had to go ashore, he had to go out to the ship and get all the reports and everything else. So we rode him out there and went aboard the ship and uh, got all the information from the uh, skipper of the ship, and then he reported it to the uh, Coast Guard headquarters. They, they took it from there, and then he finally got the ship off <clears throat> ungrounded, and uh, that was about all that happened. The Coast Guard commandeered a lot of small yachts, craft, uh, yes, they and did. sent guys up and down the coast looking for submarines. Did you have any part of that? No, but when I was at Constitution Wharf, the Sea Cloud was one of those ships. I think it belonged to uh, one of the wealthy families, the Huttons. And this sea cloud was a gorgeous ship. Teak wood, it was a beautiful yacht. And they used that to patrol the North Atlantic. And when the ice was freezing on it, they had to chop the ice. That poor ship was a mess. Mm. That's the only, the only thing I had, connection I had with something like that. I saw it there. How long were you at, uh, at Cape Cod? Six months. So, you're, um, so we're up into uh, 43. Um, and you have been in the, in the service over a year now. Yep. And have you done anything with your diesels? Not, no, because, uh, but I went, when I went back, I went back to Boston to a receiving station again, because that was the receiving station for my district. <clears throat> and uh, from there, they sent me up to Beloit, Wisconsin, uh, to a Fairbanks Morris company that builds diesel engines. And I went up there uh, for six weeks, and we worked on those engines. Well, we, we actually watched them build them. We were at the plant, and they had a school there where they would give us lessons and quiz us on the different things that we would see. And there was, we were there 
and there were a bunch of submarine men there because this engine was going to be used on submarines. So we were there together. And how long were you at Beloit? Six weeks. Six weeks. Yeah. And where did you go from there with this? Uh, you've got further training then from now. there, I went back to Boston to this receiving station, and I got assigned to the Army Manning Detachment. And Army Manning? Army Manning Detachment. What is that? That's the, uh, well, the Army had to have supplies out in the islands in the Pacific. And the Coast Guard would have tugs that would tow supplies to them. And the Coast Guard, the Army also had some small ships, small freighters that the Coast Guard would man so that they could go into small harbors and things, and deliver goods and things. And, uh, but w the tugboats would deliver things like if they needed huge barges of, or cranes or something like that, they put those on a big barge and they'd be towed with a tug. In fact, one of the things we towed was a reefer. It was a concrete one. It was about 30 feet by 40 feet, maybe eight feet high. It was a huge thing. And we towed that and it was full of, full of uh, frozen meat because it, the, it was reefer inside. We towed that up to uh, Leyte and Tack Lowen. Oh, okay. Let's, let's go back a second. Uh, have you now been assigned uh, to, to a, a tug or a ship that tows things? Not at, not at that time because they no. had tugs and they had uh, tankers and they had freighters. We were going to get on one of those three when we were assigned, but we didn't know exactly which one we were going okay, to. Okay, so you have left Boston now. Yeah, and we went out to California. Okay, did you took a train across the country? We or, took yeah. a train across the country. Yeah. Yep. And you're on your way overseas. Yes. And where'd you go in California? We went to Alameda. Alameda, mm -hmm. and then did what? And we stayed there. I forget how long we stayed there. And we, they kept us busy. They sent us to gunnery school. And they gave us a, a lot of marching. And they assigned us to little jobs around there. And that's where I got a job. I was uh, in the... Uh, I was a clerk in the postal department there, mm -hmm. and I stayed there for a while. When you went to gunnery school, uh, what kind of guns? Anti-aircraft guns. They had a plane's torn sleeves, and we'd fire at those things. Are this 40s, twin 40s, something like that, or what were you shooting? Uh, I'm not, you know, it, was a, it was a pretty fair-sized gun we were shooting. It wasn't the 40s. And you shot at the... Uh, at the sleeves. Toad sleeves? Yep. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay, then, then where did you go from there? From there, no, they wanted me, I could have stayed at that place too. At I Alameda? Yeah, yeah. I could have pitched for the softball team. <laughs> but I, I, I felt guilty. So anyway, Let's I, look at that a minute. You had an opportunity to stay there as a pitcher on a softball team? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, well, when we went to this gunnery school, Yeah. Uh, after we were through, they, were, they had everybody do something, and they had some ball games. And they had a couple of, they had a team that was stationed at the base there, and, and they uh, wanted to have this softball, they had this softball game. And uh, so the team that was stationed there was going to play a group of guys, picked from where, you know, the guys that were going to go overseas. So everybody wanted to pitch, and I went out and played in the outfield. I used to pitch a little bit of softball when I was younger or before I was left in service. And uh, so I played in the outfield and was having fun, and I, everybody was taking turns at pitching, and finally the guy got a little exasperated, says, is there anybody who can pitch? So I says, well, I, I, can, I had done a little, so I went out there to pitch, and uh, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed it. Because <laughs> I had been pitching before, I think a lot of these guys never did. Anyway, they saw me pitching. And uh, they wanted me to stay there and pitch for their team that was on the base. And uh, I thought about it seriously, but I, I, I felt guilty doing it. So it made you feel a little funny to be doing that in the wartime? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they had a good baseball team there, too. And they had a good football team, too. In fact, they had some professionals there playing, not on the softball, on football, and in the uh, baseball. 
But I, uh, I don't know, I just felt guilty. So I, I went with my friends. So you said, no, thank you. And what yeah. happened to you then? You got assigned to something else? Well, shortly after that, we were uh, taken on a, a ferry boat from Oakland, Almeda, down to San Francisco Harbor. And we had a band playing. And they sent us off on a troop ship, the Nordum. It's a Dutch Dutch liner. About, can you remember about the, what date this was? I really don't remember the date. I should have remembered the date I left the country. Well, it's but 44. Um, it was uh, It was 43, 44. Yeah, it was 44. Yeah. About what time of the year was it? Uh, well, it was probably around June. Middle of 44. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're on a liner heading out of San Francisco. Yep. With how many guys? You're going over as a passenger. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, there was a ton. This is a huge ship. It was a. It was a liner. But Dutch, were Dutch the, liner. All Coast Guard. Coast Guard. No, mostly uh, Army. Army. And they had Coast Guard. We there was a small group of Coast Guard on it, but mostly where they were Army fellows. And where were you headed? We were headed for New Guinea. And uh, I had a brother stationed in uh, Hawaii at the time. And everybody tells me every ship that leaves the United States stops in Hawaii on a way out. This one didn't. It just went straight down. <laughs> straight down to... It took us, I think, seven days to get down there. It just moved right along. It was a... Were you part of a group, convoy, uh, no, we were warships alone. around you? Just Nobody but us. You were relying on your own speed just, then to yep. keep, get you through. Just the speed. Yeah. So then you never got to Hawaii that way? Nope. No. no way. <laughs> Where did you go in New Guinea? Well, we stopped at Guadalcanal. And, uh, but we didn't stay. We just spent a couple of days here, but we stayed. We never got off the ship. The only way we could do get off the ship, if you wanted to dive in the water and swim, to dive in. but. Those little liners, they're pretty high up off the, off the water. So one day I decided I was going to do it. And I could still feel the air breezing by my head as I'm diving down there. I thought I'd never reach the water. But that was fun. That was, the, that was a good part after being on that ship all that time. And this is how you got onto Guadalcanal? You had to jump ship? <laughs> no, I had to climb back <laughs> up again on the ladder. Yeah. But then from there, we went to... Uh, Lay, and we got off the ship. Say that word again. Lay. Lay. L I E. L I E. Yeah. Where approximately is that? Uh, it was the eastern tip of New Guinea, and we only stayed there a couple of days, well, a couple of weeks, and then we moved up to Finchhaven. That was farther up farther west on the uh, shoreline there. You're going along the northern coast? Yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, that's right, yeah. And uh, What was your, um, did you have a spec number uh, as a diesel uh, motor man or something? A motor man second. Yeah, what were you expected to do? I mean, what kind of job was waiting for you? Well, I had to, I had to run the engine and take care of the engine in the, diesel, in the engine room. That's what I was supposed to do. When you got a ship? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which wouldn't be this liner that took you over. Oh, no. Had no. nothing to do with that, no. Okay. Nope. So you're now on, on New Guinea yet? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. And how many of you got off? Well, uh, there must have been about 120 of us in this group. How about the Coast troops Coast. that you were carrying? Oh, they all got off, I think, in uh, Guadalcanal. They did? Yeah. There were quite a few of them. Yeah. And Guadalcanal was secured in early 43. It was secured so, when we got there. Yeah, so yeah. these are uh, replacement troops for right. those men. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, did you finally get off your liner and uh, get a job here? Well, we, we, when we were in uh, Finchhaven, we, we spent about a, a, almost uh, three weeks there. And all we did was just march and didn't do much of anything there. And uh, then we got a, 
Oh, I played softball there too. Pitching and, again. Yes. Yeah. And there was a little guy there, nicest guy I ever met. And uh, he had the team and he wanted me to pitch for him against the Navy team that was there. He was, he was a, uh, he wasn't Navy. And uh, he wanted me to pitch for his team. And uh, I said, sure, I'll pitch. And the day we were supposed to play this team, they had bets on the game and everything else. We were given orders to go to Hollandia. So at 2.30, we were supposed to have the game. At 2.30, we're on the ship heading out of, the, out, of, out of Hollandia. And it was a funny thing when we were getting aboard that ship. They were bringing nets of cardboard boxes, nets full of cardboard boxes up and dumping them up on the ship. And everybody's trying to figure out what is in those boxes. <laughs> well, when we, got the new, when we got to Hollandia, we found out they dumped us off on the side of a hill. And then uh, army trucks came up dumping tents right where we were. We were in groups. We had platoons. And these army trucks came up dumping uh, tents off where we, were, where we were located. So we had to put the tents up. And then a truck comes by with those boxes. <laughs> and they dumped them off so many by each tent. That was K rations. <laughs> tell you, that was our food for until we got on the tugboat. That was about four weeks we had to put up with that. We ate, we ate K rations, and when we got tired of it, they had an army kitchen just a little ways up. And we go up there and we have this greasy spam and pancakes. And when you get tired of that, you come back and you eat the K rations. <laughs> that was something. During this time, uh, you had a long sail uh, from San Francisco out to New Guinea and then from a couple of ports along the uh, northern coast. How did you keep up on what was going on in the rest of the war? How did you know what was happening? Well, almost every ship or every place we went to, they had a radio and they were keeping up with it. And that's how we kept up with it. But, it's, but on that ship, on the trip over though, we, did, we, we, we didn't... Uh, have too much information on that on that trip from Oakland or San Francisco to uh, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't, we uh, not much information there. Okay, when you got out to New Guinea, uh, were you attached to MacArthur and the Seventh Fleet, or uh, were you under some other command? Well, we were under the Sixth Army. An and Army command. Yeah. Uh, but it, I don't, uh, we used to get food either from the Navy or the Army. And sometimes we go to the Navy and they say the Army has it. We go to the Army and they say the Navy has it. So, how, um, how did you and the Coast Guard wind up in an Army command? I'm a little... Well, I guess the Army needed uh, equipment delivered overseas. So they had the Coast Guard uh, work with them to deliver their things, like the, like the reaper that we hauled over that one time, that was for the Army. And uh, we hauled a huge crane from New Guinea all the way up to Manila one time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Army had some small little uh, harbor craft, and uh, we towed a whole string of those up there one time. So you, you got to a point now where you're attached to a particular ship that's, that's yeah, yours. Yeah, the LT-21. That was okay, tell us boat. about that. You finally got your ship. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And what was your job on the ship? I was a job. My, my job was to go down the engine room, make sure everything ran Keep properly. Keep it running. And kept it up. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we lucked out on that because we had uh, one large diesel, and it was an Enterprise diesel, and it was a slow-speed diesel, and it had a lot of power. But it was quiet compared to the high-speed engines. Would you describe this as a tugboat? It was a tugboat. Yeah. And tell us the size of it. It was only 90 feet long. Most of the Seagull and Teeth tugs were about, a, they had some out there 165 feet long and much broader than ours was. But this this was isn't the kind of thing you'd see in New York Harbor or Boston. This is a seagoing tug. It's a seagoing tug, yeah. but it's the smallest one that was ever out there. And you went to sea, uh, you, you said you uh, sailed up to the Philippines oh, yeah. in a 90-foot boat? Well, 
That's what we did. Tell we, us about that. Well, that was that was a that was a great thing. We'd uh, like I say, we 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 told things. We'd have to we'd have they'd be about a couple of hundred yards of uh, big hawser hooked onto them, and we'd have to, we'd tow them. And you couldn't go very fast because there were other ships in the convoy too, and you had to be careful you don't get mixed up with them. And so it would take us quite a while to get up there. We went about 13 knots. In fact, not even that. That was our top speed, 13. But it was a, it was a great trip. And you never had to worry on this tugboat because we, when the water got rough, the tugboat could just hug the water beautifully. And you didn't get a real rough ride like some of the other ships, the big ships, like the Navy ships, they had the big ones. They took, some of them took a beating out there in that, on that mm -hmm. water. But we, we had a, we had a good time on the tug tugboat. Your job's to keep the engine running, but that right. doesn't mean you had to stay in the engine room. Did you get up on deck to see what was happening? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What, what we, was happening? What was going on around you? Well, when we're out at sea, it's just peaceful, beautiful. And uh, we, uh, they figured we might get uh, bombed out of the water on our first trip up there. And I forget, they, I think they said if they got 25% of our group made it, they'd be satisfied or something, which scared the heck out of us. But nothing happened. All we saw was one plane, reconnaissance plane, I guess. Japanese plane? Yeah, Japanese plane. That was it. Nothing ever. We, we got a little itchy Who was there. with you? What kind of ships? We had no, con no, nobody came with us. We were just alone. Uh, once we went, we had a de destroyer escort with us. That was it. And I guess after the first trip, they figured they don't need anything. So we just, we just went up by ourselves with the other ships that were towing things. We had tugboats and we had small freighters going up there. You're going up to, into Manila? Well, at first we went to Tacloban. Yeah, where is that? Uh, that's on Leyte. That's where Arthur, MacArthur came back to the Philippines. I shall return. I shall return. Yeah. In fact, one day I went in town when we were in Leyte and I'm walking up the road here, and there's this big old house with a big, huge porch. It was a the house was painted yellow and trimmed in blue, and see this guy marching up and down on the front porch with General MacArthur. <laughs> he was right there. And uh, You saw MacArthur? Yeah, yeah, he was marching up on that. He was right on that porch there. Yeah. Those that, islands were never really secure. Uh, did you feel safe walking around uh, Luzon? Uh, well, by the time, when we got to Luzon, that was after Leyte. Uh, on the way up, we were listening to the radio all the way, and they were mopping up inside, and I think the last place they took was the uh, walled city. They were blasting some walls down in there and going in there. So we knew that when we got there, it was going to be secured, because they were doing that on, while we were on our way up. What did Manila look like uh, at the time you were there, after, after all the severe fighting that took place there? Well, some parts of it were in great shape, and some parts of, parts of it were rubble. A lot of the nice buildings there were kept intact. And they had one, uh, rec one uh, place out there where they had a huge, uh, well, I don't know what they would call it. It was an inside, place like a big dome. And that place was kept intact, nothing happened to it. And they had a couple of big buildings there that were kept intact. And they said that when the uh, U.S. was coming in to take it, they were trying to preserve some of those buildings so that they could use them for headquarters. Mm -hmm. And they were, it was, like downtown Manila, it was in pretty good shape. There was one huge hotel there that was in great shape, it was a beautiful one. And you know there was a lot of fighting around there because there were tanks there and bodies inside them and everything. And uh, you saw that? Yeah, I didn't see the fighting, but I saw the tanks there and the bodies were in them. You could smell them. <laughs> Jeez. The only action I really got into was when we were attacked Logan. They were raiding. They were bombing there almost every day, every night. Tell us about that. Well, you're under fire now. We're under fire, but yeah. I'm on, the, on this tugboat, so. Uh, the only time I really saw what was happening was when I come up, come up from the engine room, and I could see all the. Uh, the sky was bright red from the uh, tracers up there, and uh, I think the only, 
I couldn't believe anybody, any planes could get through that stuff, but they did. They only shot down two planes uh, in those raids. I couldn't understand how, they, how the planes could get away from that. You took gunnery courses. Uh, did you put this skill to use there? Never had to use Who it. Who was protecting your ship? You said a, a well, cook was firing a gun? The cook was, cook was using the, was on the, uh, he was a first class, so I guess he was a top ranked seaman. Tell us about the cook coming up and firing a gun. Well, he, he, had, been, he had been trained on, everybody fired machine guns, 50 calibers. So, but because he was a first class, he was the guy that would run the, he'd go up, the uh, skipper said he's the fellow who was going to man the machine gun up there. And he had the executive officer right there with him. But uh, I don't know what he was going to do. It's a good thing the cook was there. <laughs> yeah. Did your work, when you were in uh, Manila, did your work ever take you near Corregidor? Oh, yeah. And yeah. Did in you fact, see when that? We, when we pulled in, uh, they were still using flamethrowers around there and digging guys out. And there was one little island on, in, in the harbor there, and it's a... It's almost like a perfectly round island, and they were going in there with flamethrowers after guys. But Corregidor was pretty well settled by then, and you could see where it had been really. They said they changed the shape of it from the blasting, and it was a mess. Yeah. Did you actually get into the tunnels yourself? No, I didn't. I didn't go aboard. But we did go around behind Corregidor. In fact, I used to take a small outboard motor we had, and I'd go behind Corregidor, and I'd just spend time with the motor, with the outboard motor and the boat there, and just sailing around just to have some fun for myself. How about the Bataan Peninsula? Did you see any of that? Yeah, well, I never went ashore. I went over there, but uh, we were in the water by it. And uh, mentioned you, funny you mentioned that. There was one time, this was, actually we'd been in the middle for quite a while. We're in the water, we're not, not close, not far from the Bataan Peninsula there, and we see somebody walking. And we looked, and we had binoculars, and we looked, and it was a Japanese guy. Apparently, he had been buried someplace out there, you know, in one of these tunnels or something, and hidden someplace, and he came out and surrendered himself. That was, uh, those, those guys were really something else. <laughs> I guess some of them didn't know the war was over. For them. <laughs> For them, yeah. yeah. Right. Did you feel that uh, when you're in a situation such as you described and um, everything you did mechanically, that you'd been well trained by the Coast Guard, that you did, the schooling had paid off and you were the right man for the right job? Well, by the time I got on board the tugboat, yeah, I've, I felt pretty secure because I, it pretty, everything was pretty familiar to me. I, this instructor that we had at Hemfield Diesel School he was very good, and he really showed us what an engine was and what to look for and what to, what to watch out for. So when I got aboard the tugboat, I felt pretty much at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you spoke about being in a little boat. Did you get free time to, uh, I'm not going to say sightseeing, but did you get opportunities to go see the areas around the places where you'd been docked? Oh, that's the beautiful part of it. Yeah. With a little tugboat, we drove, we went right in all the time. And uh, being as we just had a small, we had a, our crew was, it was 50, let's see, 17 men on it at the time. One time we had 21 for some reason, I don't know, but that's the most we ever had. And uh, as long as somebody was there to take care of the engine room, you could go on liberty. If you had somebody, you know, doing your watch, you can go ashore. And we, we could go ashore almost any time we wanted to when we were down because somebody would take over for you. And uh, I, I like that. That was pretty good. What was your rank at this time, Steve? I was a Motormax second. And I never even thought uh, anything about trying to advance it or anything. That never even entered my mind. How much were you being paid at that time? 56 or $57 a month. So when you went ashore, you were a big spender. Yeah. <laughs> I had the money sent home. <laughs> Good Lord. And I used to get money from home. My uncle and them, and they used to send me money. You open up an envelope and you see some green in it. That was terrific. You'll take it, yeah. Yeah. 
No, I, I kept, I forget, I kept so much of it myself and the rest went home. My mother was putting in the bank for me. Because when I went overseas, I was engaged and I wanted to save the money. Yeah. You've, you've described trips from the northern coast of New Guinea up to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Where else did you go? Well, when I was in the Philippines, they had this tugboat and uh, somebody said there was something wrong with the mechanism when you want to shift from forward to a reverse or stop or something. But I never found any trouble at all with it. So anyway, they ended up saying the tugboat was going to stay in Manila Harbor for their duration. So I transferred from there to a small tanker that was going to go up to Japan. I had a good buddy on that tanker. So I went with him. And we were right at Corregidor. In the back of Corregidor, they had a big dry dock. And they had this tanker in there taking care of the, 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 uh, the bottom of the boat. They were scraping it down and repainting it. And uh, that's what it was when I got aboard it. And uh, shortly after that, the Army gave us a full supply of winter clothes. We got pants, shoes, socks, hats, Eisenhower jacket, and the coat jacket. Did you think of this as a bad sign? That they're going to send you some place that you well, really don't want to go? Well, I knew we were going to go to Japan. I knew this tanker was going to go up there. So it wasn't a sign for me or anything. I knew that that's where it was going. So. I wasn't gonna. I didn't want to stay in the Philip in the in Manila the rest of the war. Mm -hmm. So we were heading up. We were gonna go up there, but before we went up, they dropped that bomb, and the war ended. So I remember all they did in, in Manila. A lot of guys were shooting up flares. That was about it. But it was a good feeling to know it was over with. The end of the war came, and you're in Manila. Manila. And get um, ready to go north. So we've missed uh, the end of the war in Europe a um, couple of months back. Uh, did yeah. that have any effect on uh, where you went or what you did? Uh, no, I don't think so. We were still going to go up there whether the war ended in Europe or not, I guess. But you know, talking about the war in Europe, there were fellows that were over there when the war ended and they got aboard troop ships and they figured they were going home. They ended up going to the Philippines. And I was there watching some of these fellows come off the, off the, off the, one of the troop ships. They were the saddest looking bunch I've ever seen <laughs> because from all the way over there to the Pacific, they spent all that time on, on the ships. And every time they stopped someplace, there'd be a rumor saying that they're gonna get off you know, the rumors really spread. So they were, had their hopes high several times, and each time they just kept on going. And I, I, never, I felt so sorry for these fellows that, that ended up over in the Philippines. As August 45 approached, let's come back just a month or so ago, did you have any feeling you were going to be involved in the invasion of Japan? Well, we all figured that, that that's the way it's going to end up. We figured that was going to be we're all going to go up there because I figure the only way you're going to do anything is, is to go right up there. So that's what we led to believe anyway. Was there a, c a collection point uh, around you, the, the, these guys coming over from Europe, but were other troops beginning to mass in the Philippines relative to a push no, up I north? Didn't, I didn't see that. The only thing I saw was all these fellows that just came over on the ships. Uh, Why were you going to go to Japan on this particular ship? Because that ship was assigned to go up. Okay. Yeah, that was one of the Army ships. And it was going to take oil off of the tanker out in the deep water and bring it into the dock because they figured they couldn't bring the big ones into the docks because you know, the docks weren't taken care of and the, the, the harbors had to be drained, dredged. Initially, when you joined the Coast Guard way back there in Ohio, uh, what did you sign up for? Four years? A four-year hitch or to the no, duration I signed, I signed of the up war? for the duration, yeah. yeah. I was a reserve. So the when duration. the war ended in, in the Philippines, uh, you, you began looking to go home? No, <laughs> no, I wasn't looking to go home. Uh, I was just waiting to see what we were going to do. And then uh, we went up to Japan uh, with this tanker. Yeah. We, we went up to, they said that the tanker was going to go up there no matter what. 
So we, we, we went up there. Where did you go? Well, we went up to, uh, we were supposed to go to Osaka, but on the way up they said we can't go there, so we went up to Nagoya. And on the way up there, we uh, were going to hit a typhoon. So we were not, we were not too far from Nago uh, Okinawa, so we pulled into o uh, Buckner Bay because the small ships would go into, in and the big ships would come out to ride out the typhoons. So we went into Buckner Bay and we spent a day or two in there. And the typhoon wasn't that bad. So anyway, we left Buckner Bay and headed up to Japan and uh, we were up by Nagoya. And there was another typhoon coming. And we are gonna pull into the channel going into the Nagoya and the small boat comes out, a wooden one. And uh, it was a minesweeper. And this was a narrow channel and they pulled over to us and they said that if you go in there, be careful, we haven't swept it out completely. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> here, comes, here comes the typhoon right. and we're out here. So anyway, he told us, one of the guys on the, on the other ship said, why don't you just run this tanker aground? He said, then you don't have to worry about it. But uh, we talked the skipper out of that because if you get, if you, you, we saw some ships down in New Guinea that were run aground and they stayed there for the whole war. I mean, you, you know, you don't want to run aground and stay there. So anyway, the typhoon didn't let, wasn't that, well, didn't bother us that much. And then we ended up going in and going and spent time there until I went home. You were present at a very valuable point in time so far as historians are concerned. Um, an American pulling into Japan yeah. right after the war ended. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what you saw or sensed? Did you have any contact with the Japanese? Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Sure. We, uh, uh, oh, one thing, before we went, got to, when that second typhoon that hit when we were in Nagoya, Buckner Bay got hit with that big one. Now, you must remember that. They got wiped out. There's a guy in this room that does very clearly. You were there? We were there before it happened. And while we were there the first time, it wasn't too bad, so we left. And then the, right after we left, you guys got hit. That must have been unbelievable. Blew out everything. Man, oh man, that's, now that's something. We were both there at the same time there. And another thing, when, when I was in there, I said the larger ships would come out. And we're pulling in. This one ship is coming out. There was a kid on it. And I'm looking, they look familiar. He was the guy I came into service with from home, and we both could holler and wave to each other. But you that passed was each other yeah, at the, on in the, the channel? I'm going in, he's going out. That was the only time we saw each other. Did you ever see each other after the war? Well, we were home, yeah. 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 But when we were up, up in Japan, we went into this uh, place where they have oil tanks, because that's where we were going to stay. So if, when, the, when the big ships came up with the oil, we were going to go out in the harbor and get the oil on our ta small tanker and, and put them in the uh, put them in fill the tanks. So, but we were able to go ashore whenever we wanted to, and we went right downtown in Japan in Nagoya, and, and it was funny. The people, nobody seemed to have any disrespect for us. We didn't get any dirty looks. Nothing. They, everybody was very, very kind and polite. We went into the stores and uh, bought things, and uh, even went out in the countryside, out by some farms, and by some schools, and when we go by schools, the kids would come running out, and waving at us, and come out smiling at us, and everything else. I guess they didn't see many Americans out there or something. What about physical damage? Uh, had there been air raids, uh, naval raids, Halsey's fleet and his thousand airplanes in this area? Well, there weren't too many raids around there because we never, I don't know if they, uh, I didn't see much damage around where we were. The Goya looks pretty good to me. It was in good shape. Except a couple of places where they had uh, underground, uh, huge rooms underground where they had all kinds of airplane parts, Mitsubishi airplanes. They had all kinds of parts on there. In some places you could see where they were starting to cave in. Now, I don't know if that was from any bombing or if they were just, uh, from time to starting to deteriorate. At any time did you get to talk with Japanese, uh, the man in the street kind of thing? Well, we talked to the 
tried to talk with the people the uh, people that wait, waited on us in in the in the department stores. What were in the stores? They had they had uh, all kinds of things. They had uh, silk kimonos. They had all kinds of they had uh, mostly clothing stuff in there. And uh, but it was a uh, it was amazing just to walk around in there and just like mm. you were at home. It's it was, you'd think that people would kind of resent you in that, but they were very kind. Was it your impression that they were well fed or had an, uh, enough food to eat? They all looked good to me. Yeah. Yeah, they did. And it was, uh, the women looked healthier than the men, though. I noticed that. The women looked healthier than the men. How many men were around? Was it uh, older guys? Mostly women. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the reason. That's the reason. They were the older guys, or younger, really, really old or really young, yeah. That was the reason. Yeah. Did you go any place else in Japan? No, I just stayed in Nagoya. That's, that was uh, where I was. There was a little thing happened in a bank in Japan. We were gonna, talking about these army guys that came from Italy. We went, this is Mickey Rash and I, we went into the bank to get some Japanese money and we're standing in line. And when we were over there, we, we were rarely in, in uniform. You know, like I had dungarees on, army shirt, I was wearing loafers that I had sent from home. And we're in this, we're in this bank and uh, I see this colonel, army colonel looking at us from across the room. And he kept looking at us and I told Mickey, I says, I think we're in trouble. He says, why? I said, that guy's looking at us. I think you're going to get us for being out of uniform. Uh, I had my Eisenhower jacket on. And uh, so he came over to us, and he had a funny grin on his face. And he says, what outfit are you guys in? I said, the Coast Guard. He said, the Coast Guard. You got an Army jack Eisenhower jacket on? He said, he said, where'd you get that? I said, well, we got, all this. We got a whole issue of Army clothes down in uh, Manila before we came up here. And he says, I was in Italy, he says, I'm a colonel, lieutenant colonel, he says, I'm a colonel, he says, and look at me, I'm in fatigues, and I'm freezing. He said, you guys in the Coast Guard, he says, you got my, you got army clothes on to keep you warm. And he says, what kind of an outfit are we in anyway? But that was funny. He just couldn't believe that, you know, we had all the clothes. And, but what happens is when they're shipping that stuff around, it gets held up here, held up there. He probably got his by now. <laughs> But that was. If I recall, Eisenhower jackets were hard to come by. Well, we had them. We yeah. had the jackets, and we had the the uh, coat with the little, little string on, you know, the car coat type thing. What was the weather like? You're you're describing well, in a Japan, cold kernel. In Japan, it would get it uh, got cold in the evenings. Yeah. Yeah, because this was around Thanksgiving, getting getting close to. Uh, well, yeah, I left there not long after Thanksgiving. So in the evening, it was pretty nippy. Yeah. So you're there in November of 45. Yep. Yeah. Well, Did we you, got there before, but we, we were there. Yeah. I was there at November. Did yeah. you go anyplace else in Japan? To, could you get on a train and go somewhere else? And I probably could have, but we didn't. No. You still had $57 a month, right? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that kind of restricted mm. you a little bit. Mm -hmm. What did you do now? Uh, did they send you someplace else, or are you finally going home? No, we were finally going to go home. And uh, like I say, we got aboard this ship and went over to uh, pulled in the harbor of Seoul over in Korea. But we didn't go in too far in. We stayed out pretty far. And uh, that's where they have some pretty high tides out there, too. Anyway, we were there, we had to wait. We had to wait for about five days before the Army guys got down. Because they were coming down from North Korea on a, I mean from Korea on a, uh, from the, on a train. And they said the trains kept breaking down, breaking down. And it took them forever to get down. They were, they were about four days late. And when they got there, it was snowing. This is on the southern tip of Korea. And they got, well, not all of it, it's, it's, it's in southern Korea, anyway. And they got... Is uh, this Seoul or Pusan? 
I think it was Seoul. Okay. And uh, anyway, they finally came out on these landing barges, and it took a long time because there were quite a few of them. And these poor guys were frozen. And they're climbing up these monkey ladders up on this ship to get up there. And they had their gear. And some of them had souvenirs that they had kept all the way till they get to the ship they're going home on. And they're climbing up and their hands are so cold they're dropping them. They have bayonets and things and they're dropping them. Felt so sorry for them. So all we did was get over there on the side of the ship. So as they're coming up, we grabbed their bags and everything else and helped them get in. But they had a rough time. Now, were you here on duty, as it were, or is this your transportation? That was home? my transportation. We were with the merchant crew. We were with the merchant crew on that ship. There was only about uh, 15 of us, Coast Guardsmen. Are you working on the engines again? Not there. No. No. no all I did was uh, stay in my bunk, go up on top side and watch the water go by, <laughs> and. Uh, eat their food. My God, that was the first good food I ever had overseas when we got with the merchant, merchant marine there. Boy, oh boy. That's one thing we never had out there was good food. Any decent food even. Never had any fresh vegetables, any, any all we ever, we, we lived mostly on uh, bread, powdered eggs and powdered, and uh, those dried potatoes. And we had some kind of sauce in cans that were on this tugboat that I was on. And we, some kind of a sauce. We had that on the bread with the potatoes. We didn't get much in the way of good food. You had to be on these big ships, I guess, to get that. Mm. Are you finally on your way home now, Steve? This is, or where did you go from Korea? From Korea we went, we were going to go to Washington. The state of Washington, because that's the shortest So route. you really are going home. Going home, yeah. yeah. Okay. Did and they, they give you Hawaii this time? No. No. They changed their. They said that the weather up there was too bad, so they directed us down to uh, Newport Beach in California. Mm -hmm. And we got there just about Christmas time, and we were going to dock. And they had everything put away on the on this ship we were on, and uh, they figured we can't dock till the next morning. So we spent Christmas Eve out on the out on the water. So they brought out some canned cherries and canned ham, and that was our big meal. But I didn't care. We were, we were home anyway. So You went ashore, and um, it, this is went Christmas, to a receiving Day now, station. Christmas Day in 1945. Yeah. And went to a receiving station. There. Yeah. And uh, then I find out that I was going to stay there. For some reason, they were jammed up at all the uh, discharge centers, and I was going to stay in California. Well, I'd been away from home almost going on, well, 18 months, two years, and uh, I didn't want to stay there. You know, I wanted to get discharged. I wanted to get discharged back home. I wanted to get home and see my friends and my, my uh, fiance. And uh, so uh, I went to see everybody there. I even went to see a chaplain. <laughs> First time well, I ever went to You see. were a desperate man. I was desperate. <laughs> hey, I had the most beautiful girl in the world home waiting for me. And uh, I hadn't seen my parents, you know. And all my buddies were home already. I went in before they did. They saw me leave, and they were waiting for me to come home. Are you, aren't you under the point system at this time? Yeah, but I had enough points to get out. Yeah, I should think so. But. Uh, they, they said, you know, I had to wait before I could get discharged. So anyway, I finally went to a, the, the, I finally got smartened up. I went to a station there, and I went to a yeoman there. And these guys, they're pretty good. I told him the situation. So he says, tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll get back to you. So a day go, went by, and uh, he got in touch with me, or he had me get in touch with him. He had me all set up for a trip back to, back to Canton, and he says, when you get to Canton, you call this number. He gave me a number to call. It's a Coast Guard base in Cleveland. He said, uh, I'll take all your papers that are here, and I'll send them to Cleveland. And he said, you won't have to come back here at all. He said, you stay right there. 
So that's what I did. I went back and I went home and when my time was up, I called up Cleveland. They told me to come up there. And they said, you're going to get discharged at a place in Detroit, but you're going to have to wait a week or two. So they put me in a lighthouse right in the Cleveland Harbor. A lighthouse? A lighthouse. <laughs> I stayed there for till I went to Detroit and I finally got discharged there, February 22nd. And what was your rank? Still Motomax 2nd. Okay. Yeah. So you're home, you're discharged, uh, and lived happily ever after. Yep. Yeah. Let's look at uh, a career here that uh, you covered a lot of ground and saw a lot of things. Was there a most memorable experience in all the things you saw, something that stands out in your mind? Boy, there was one. <clears throat> when we were in New Guinea, we had to get fuel. So we went up to a, a little isolated place where they had a where they had some fuel barges and where you could get you get the fuel. And there weren't there wasn't much of in the way of docking space or anything there. So uh, they told us we'd have to wait till the next morning to come in and get our fuel. And there was a boat out in the harbor, a large freighter. So we went out and we docked alongside that thing. And uh, you're in your tugboat and you're seeing this big sheet of iron in front of you there. And we're looking across where the dock, where the uh, uh, oil tankers are, or the oil barges are. And uh, all of a sudden, we see a wall of fire coming at us. It was about a couple hundred yards long, and it looked like it was about eight feet high, and it was just coming right at us. Well, we went down the engine, we got that engine started so fast, and I'm waiting for the skipper to give us the signal to move, and we're not moving. And I said, my God, what's going to happen when this flame gets to us? It was unbelievable. And then all what happened, there was a, somebody had, I guess, uh, somehow gasoline got spilled on the surface, and it burned out before it reached us. But that was, I'll never forget that. That was unbelievable. You know, you could see like you see guys with flamethrowers and stuff like that, but this thing here was a wall coming right at us. That was that was scary. <laughs> a little more of it, and it would reach you. Wouldn't yeah, it, it stopped yeah. about 40, 50 yards away from us. Did you have a nice conversation with the skipper after this was all over? <laughs> well, he saw he saw it stop before, you yeah. know, and we so. We didn't Could see you him. actually have outrun it? You know. No way. No way. No. It just would have made you this feel tugboat, better to top, be moving. Top yeah. speed at this tugboat is yeah. 13 knots. No, we couldn't have never, we'd have never done it. I can see why you would remember that. Oh, that was something else. How about a most memorable character? Some person, other than Douglas MacArthur on the porch, but mm -hmm. somebody else uh, you remember from your years in service. Well, I know there were some uh, admirals there in some of these large ships in, in the Philippines, but the one person I remember a lot is a kid we had from California on the tugboat. He, uh, he was really into music, Western music, <clears throat> and I guess there was a singer, Roy Acuff, and he was a top singer in that Western stuff. And I came from Boston, from Canton, you know, West, and I liked this big band music, Artie Shaw and Jung Minner, all those, I knew all mm -hmm. those. So he's talking about, we're talking music, <coughs> and he's telling me about, about... Uh, Have a drink. <coughs> he's telling me about Roy Acuff, <coughs> and I said, I'd never heard of him. Well, I thought the kid was going to cry. <coughs> he's looking at me, you don't know Roy Acuff. And uh, anyway, this kid could sing all these songs, and he had a good voice, and he kept us all loose and light on a ship. And he had one song, and anything, any, anytime anything happened or something was going to happen or something, he'd come up with this song, there's blood on the saddle tonight, and he would wail that thing out, something wicked. But it, he gave us more fun and more pleasure, and kept us loose. He was quite a guy. Blood on the saddle tonight. <laughs> Blood on the saddle tonight. <laughs> he would really hum it up, it sing it up. like a real hit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot was... of serious things happened to you in your, <clears throat> your career. Was a, a, a most humorous thing, some funny thing that you tell your wife and grandchildren about? 
Well, nothing serious. There was one time I became the hero on our tugboat to our crew. That was, uh, we were in Tack Loban. We were supposed to go back to New Guinea. <clears throat> and the crew, all the guys, they loved being out at sea. They didn't love to be in shore. So we were going to go back, but we needed water. So our skippers and the engineering officer they went ashore to go see about getting water for us. They came back, they couldn't get any water. And uh, I said, uh, you got to have, you got to get water. I said, they have it there. And I said, there's some of these small freighters, they're over there getting water. They said, yeah, but we got to wait. <clears throat> so the guys on the crew, they were all upset. So I took our little boat that we had, the little flat bottom thing with a 10 horsepower engine on. I went in shore and I went down where the water, watering hole was. And there was some uh, officer there who I tried to tell our story to, and he said, there's no way you're gonna get water. He said, your officers were here before. He said, you got no business coming down here. And uh, I, told, I tried to tell him, I said, well, these ships aren't gonna go back to New Guinea, and we are. <clears throat> so anyway, he says, he said, if you wanna, if you wanna get satisfaction, go see so-and-so. It was some uh, lieutenant colonel was in charge of the whole place there in the army. <clears throat> he was in the, uh, he, he was in the, uh, the building there in, the main building they had left in uh, Tack Loman there. So I said, I'll go up and see him, and he laughed. So I went up to this town hall, <clears throat> and I go in the front door, and I asked somebody where a certain, I can't remember the officer's name, but they told me where he was, well, girl told me he's upstairs. So I go up the stairs, and there's a landing, and on this landing there were six pilots, and uh, they saw me coming up. I had, I had a T-shirt on, I had a cap on, and I had dungarees. And they saw me coming up. And they said, uh, I asked them, I said, is this where so-and-so is? And they said, yeah. I said, what do you want to see him for? So I told them, I said, hey, I said, we got to go back to New Guinea. We need water, and the guy won't give it to us. So they laughed. And some of them said, you go up and see him. He's a nice guy. He'll, he'll get you the water. And uh, so the other guy said, hey, you're not going to get any place. So I think these guys took bets or something. Anyway, I went up, and there was this secretary there. She was a whack, whack outfit, and uh, she wanted to know what I wanted, and I told her I wanted to see, him, see the officer about the water situation. So she said, well, I think he'll see you. So she went over to him, and then she came back to me and said, he'll see you. And he was sitting over in the corner. So I went over there and I sat down, and he started talking to me, asking where I was from what outfit I was in, this and that. And then he said, what can I do for you? So I told him about the water situation. And he said, you mean the guy down there? He said, he means that the guy won't let you get water, won't give you water when, when you have to have it to go back down? I says, no. So he said, let me give you a note. So he gave me a note and I came, I walked back down the stairs and these pilots down there, they watched me coming down the stairs. They said, how'd you make out? I told him, I said, here's the slip to get the water. Well, three of them were happy and three of them couldn't believe it. So anyway, I went back down and I'm walking down this gangway down to this officer again. And he gives me a look like, what are you doing here? So I gave him the slip and I thought he was going to faint. So he got on the phone and lo and behold, there was a water tanker out in the harbor. So he told me to go, he gave me the number of it, said, you go out there and tell him. Tell you're gonna you're gonna get water there, so I went by the tugboat by our tugboat, and all our guys were on looking over, waiting for me to get there, and I says, "Get ready for water!" And I got a big cheer. I was a hero. <laughs> so I went out to this tanker, and I t it was a big barge tanker, and they told me, you know, we're gonna come over for water, and they told me where to, where we should pull in. And I got back to the tugboat, we were all ready to go, up the anchor, and everything else, and we went over there and got the water, and then we got to go back down to New Guinea. But that was a funny thing there, I'll tell you. But this officer, he was a real nice guy. But it was only common sense, you know? Yeah, it was, that was pretty good. You know where I thought you were going with that? That he was going to turn out to be a Roy Acuff fan. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was. <laughs> you were discharged in Cleveland, Ohio. Detroit. Excuse me, Detroit. You had yeah. gone to Cleveland first, then the Detroit. My last stop. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you came home, um, 
Did you join any reserve units, any, anything no, in the I military, didn't. something no. like that? Did you join any veterans organizations? No. Uh, why or why not? Well, I really don't know. I, I went into service to serve and I come out, I was just going to get out and, and that was it. And you, I, you'd done your four years or Yeah, almost four like years, that. yeah, that was close. What were your feelings about coming home? You, you'd, you'd been in, uh, joined the Navy, so to speak, and seen the world. Uh, now you're home again. Yep. Your fiance, did you marry shortly thereafter? We got married the next year yep. after I got settled, because I stayed in Boston instead of going home. And you kind of felt it's time to get on with the rest of your life kind of yep, thing? I yeah, was pretty well, busy because I was starting off from scratch in a new place. Back home, I had a job, I had everything, but uh, my wife, she would rather have stayed here, so I figured, hey, this Boston, this area here is a lot better than Ohio. There's more to do here, and it sure ended up that so way. So everything was pretty new to you it when you came up home? Good, yeah. What kind of reception do, had, did you receive as, a, as an ex-serviceman in 1946? <clears throat> well, everybody was happy to see me and they were all glad that I came back and I did my duty and uh, when you came home um, mom and dad were there and your, your brother and sister yeah, right? they were there my uh, niece was there my little niece now, <laughs> now you got a new wife did you discuss with them what you had done tell them about some a lot of the things you told us about today I don't think so that kind of just wasn't part of it. You, I was so glad to be there and everything else. And yeah, starting over again. You never sat down with your dad some evening and. He died before I got home. I'm sorry. <clears throat> yeah, he died before I got home. Yeah. How about your mother or brother? Did they ask you where you'd been, what you'd seen? Well, yeah, they asked me where I was and everything else, but I didn't go into it too much of it. I told them what I enjoyed, you know, like being out on the water. I said I, yeah. I loved that. That was great. Steve, how important to you was serving in the military? You're 81 now, that was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got a good country, and uh, we were being attacked, so it's only natural you want to do your part, because it's worth, worth fighting for, I would say. And I just, Figured it's something you got to do and you should do, and I didn't even think twice about it. Just that's it. Did uh, serving in the military? Do you feel it somehow affected uh, your life? Changed it in any way? No, <clears throat> didn't change it, but it made me appreciate everything I have that much more. <clears throat> A lot of things we take for granted. <laughs> if you're in a service. <laughs> You got a lot of time to think, and you see when you're without things, and uh, you can really appreciate what you have. And if people who've never been without some of this stuff, they'll never appreciate what they really have. They take it for granted. That's too bad. What did you think then, and what do you think now about the war you were involved in? <clears throat> well, I think it was something we had to do, and I think we did the right thing. That's about it. Was there any point during your service where you had a uh, time at sea where you were thinking about what you were doing? Did you ever, ever have a change of heart about uh, those motivations that uh, made you enlist in, in the first place? No. No. You know, when you grew up during the Depression, <laughs> uh, you, you kind of mature a little bit faster. And because uh, it's pretty rough. So I, when, I, when I had to go into service, I figured you know, it's something you should do and you're going to, might as well do. And I didn't resent it. and. Uh, it was just something, if, if you had a choice, if, if, whether we went to war or not, I mean, put it this way, 
if the war didn't happen, I'd been happier. <laughs> but I mean, we had yeah, to go. There was no choice. Yeah. Do you feel there was a difference in, in public opinion uh, regarding the veterans who served in World War II, Korea or Vietnam or other wars? I think those men got, that was what black mark on our, I think on our, civil, on our uh, society. What was that? The way some of those fellows were treated when they came back from Vietnam. I think it was awful. I mean, I know what little bit I saw over there, and I know these guys over there, they had, it must, it was, when you don't know who you're fighting, who your friends are and who your foes are, I mean, they were in, put in such a horrible position there. I think it was, it, I felt so sorry for those guys. Man, those guys were real heroes. Oof. When you came home, um, did you take advantage of or receive any veterans benefits, uh, hospitalization, GI Bill, further education, anything like that, a, a mortgage? Uh, GI mortgage. I think I got a GI mortgage. Yeah, that was it. Above all, we've we've talked now for an hour and twenty minutes. Um, is there any one thought, one incident that maybe you've talked about or haven't that you'd like to share with your family or others who will see these tapes uh, years from now? Well. <clears throat> All I can say is get your priorities right and put the things that are important in order. And I feel like when I was out there alone thinking, I figured God, family, and friends were about the most important things, plus health, that you can have. And uh, I think. They should really be happy that they have a family and friends and cherish them because those are treasures. That's something that's very important. Steve, we thank you for coming in today. Uh, we appreciate your here. participation in this program. Thank you. Thank you very much.